I'm Phil Giuliani here back again on Messianic Lamb Network, and this show is One in Messiah. And this is a show, as I started to say before the the crash, <laughs> and you have to understand my very sophisticated high power studio is in one of the bedrooms of my house. <laughs> and I don't have tens of thousands of dollars of equipment. But anyway, I think it's back on now. But One in Messiah is a ministry that I started about seven years ago now. And we connect passages from the Tanakh and passages from the New Testament, the Brit Hadashah. And it's really, it's based on two scriptures. One is Ephesians 2, 14 and 15, which says that Yeshua in his flesh broke down the partition between the two, making one new man. And the one new man is a very important concept to me in the uh, scripture study that I've done over the last 25 years or so. And I always like to emphasize, as I mentioned, I don't know if you got it before the crash, but I like to emphasize that there's not a Jewish body and a Gentile body. There's one body of Messiah because he is redeemer of everyone every tribe, every tongue, every nation, and so forth. And the other scripture that it's based on is John 5, verse 39, where Yeshua himself says that all the scriptures testify of him. All the scrolls are about him. And he doesn't say some of them are or a little bit here, and a little bit there. All of them are. And so as you study Torah, as you study the prophets, as you study the writings, you see them pointing to Messiah. You see them pointing to Yeshua. And of course, when he comes and fulfills the um, those prophetic writings and those types and the shadows and the foretellings that are in Torah, especially the blood atonement, then the cross becomes the center of salvation history. And we look back toward the cross and the people in the Tanakh, even though they didn't know what the cross was going to be because they didn't know about crosses until the Romans came into the land about, I don't know, 60 BC or so. And so they looked forward to the cross while we look back toward the cross. But either way, the cross is the center of salvation history. And so it stands to reason that all of the Tanakh is about Messiah. And of course, the Brit Hadashah shows us in the gospel and in the letters how this has all been fulfilled. And so the plan goes through the whole scripture. But since we're approaching the time of Pentecost and I'm sorry, Passover and Holy Week and Good Friday and Resurrection Day. Um, and we have about, I don't know, six weeks or so till that, till um, the crucifixion and resurrection of Messiah. These next few programs are going to be about sacrifice and are going to be about blood atonement. But we're going to start today and probably next week as well, since um, I probably lost about 10 minutes during this little crash ahead. <laughs> um, we're going to start with the concept of repentance, because one thing that is very clear from the New Testament, from the Gospels, from the writings that come after the Gospels and Paul's writings and Peter's writings and John's writing, that the way into the kingdom is through repentance. Because the key is that sin has to be dealt with. And Yeshua, with through his sacrifice and through the shedding of his blood, as I like to say, capital H and capital B, through the shedding of his blood, that blood has the power to forgive all sin. Does it automatically? No. Nothing is done automatically because God created us with free will 
and we have the will to either accept or refuse the offer of grace. And it's um, it's it's kind of amazing how many people refuse the offer of grace, but the the forgiveness and the salvation that is available through what Yeshua did on the cross through his blood is available to all, but you have to apply it to yourself. And the way that you do that is through repentance, through re repentance of what you've done, repentance of your sins, accepting him as Lord and Savior, having what the New Testament calls metanoia, which is the Greek word that's used for repentance. And I'm sure, as you know, since um, if you're watching this either now or later on my YouTube channel or later on the podcast or whatever it is, since you're watching this, I'm sure that you have repented of your sin and you've come to Messiah. You've accepted him as Lord and Savior and you've had metanoia and you've changed your life. But it's more than just a change in your mind. It's a change of your heart. It's a change of direction of your life. The things that were important are not as important now. The th maybe things that you didn't think about before suddenly become incredibly important, not only in a one-time event, but through the whole rest of your life whether you live another five years or 20 years or 50 years, these things are important through your whole life. And as I always remind people when I teach that the, the Christian life is not a 100 yard dash. It's not over in 9.9 .9 seconds. It's a very long marathon. And um, I think the best description of this is the one that's provided by the, the writer to the Hebrews where he talks about how we're heading for the ultimate promised land, which is heaven. And the people, the Israelites, when they were in the wilderness, were heading for a physical promised land, were delivered. They lived 40 years in the wilderness. They went to the land of Canaan. We are delivered by Yeshua, by the cross, by the, his blood. We live our lives in a wilderness heading toward the ultimate promised land, which, of course, is heaven. And so repentance is how you get into this kingdom, the kingdom, I should say, the capital K. And if, you, um, if, you, if you've been watching The Chosen, the series, um, I would refer back to the conversation that Yeshua has with Nicodemus, who's a teacher of Israel, which was such an important office. There weren't many men who had the title teacher of Israel, but Nicodemus did. And although the, um, the series takes a lot of license with script and so forth, and I understand that to make a better story, the the biblical account is much more brief. But Nicodemus in that video seems quite surprised when Yeshua tells him that he's come to deal with sin. And he's not come to deal with the Romans. He's not come to deal with political kingdoms. He's not come to deal with social structures, although those things work themselves out. He's come to deal with sin. And this is the problem starting in the garden, starting in Genesis 3.15. The problem is sin, not politics, not social structure, and not almost anything else that you can name. So since I mentioned that repentance is the way into the kingdom, and I mentioned about John the Baptist and Yeshua that um, proclaimed this word, it makes it sound like this was not talked about in the Tanakh, in the Old Testament, or in the Older Testament. And as you know, the, the term Old Testament, although we understand what that means, the term Old Testament kind of gives the idea that it's not important anymore, it's the old days, we can discard that and 
we can go on with the New Testament because after all, this is the new thing. This is the new covenant. And it is the new covenant that Jeremiah talks about in chapter 31, starting at verse 31. But as I mentioned, the Tanakh has all of the elements of salvation, the plan, the history, and even how it's going to take place through it all. Right down to the point where, as you know, many rabbis came to believe, and actually I saw an interview on YouTube just a couple of days ago with an ultra-Orthodox rabbi who still believes that there will actually be two messiahs. There'll be a messiah who is a suffering servant, who they, and this particular rabbi called um, Mashiach ben Yosef, Messiah, the son of Joseph. And then there'll be another Messiah who's Mashiach ben David, who's going to be the son of David in the sense of the royal family, the throne, and all these things that were discussed in 2 Samuel and so forth of how Messiah was going to be king and was going to be a warrior king and in many, many places in, in the Tanakh. And we see that fulfilled in the Revelation. But what he, they, didn't understand and we understand is this is fulfilled in the same person who was Yeshua. And of course, this happens in two different comings, so to speak. He already came as the suffering servant, as the Lamb, capital L, to deal with sin. He will come back as king. And all of these prophecies will be fulfilled. So to use a good example about repentance, we're going to go back to the Tanakh and we're going to discuss a few highlights from the book of Jonah which is a very short book. If you've never, I, I can't imagine you've never read Jonah. Everybody knows the story of Jonah and the whale. It wasn't a whale. The scripture said it was a great fish. Regardless of what it was, it was some kind of aquatic animal that Joseph, I'm sorry, that Jonah spent three days in. And Yeshua said the only sign that generation was going to have was the sign of Jonah. So he compared himself spending three days in the earth with Jonah spending three days in the belly of the great fish. But today in the time we have left, we're going to talk about kind of the highlights of what Jonah's mission was and how repentance came to a very large city because of Jonah's preaching. And we're going to go into, probably in the next show, because I don't want to rush it, but we're going to go into how there are many, there are long passages in the, in the book of Jonah that actually show the suffering of Messiah and how that suffering leads to forgiveness. And so it'll be... Um, a two-part show, obviously. But as I mentioned before about John the Baptist and Yeshua, we know John the Baptist came baptizing in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance. You know, at that time, everybody was familiar with the mikvah. At this time, we are familiar with mikvah, but we are familiar with Christian baptism. John's baptism was not technically Christian baptism. And it wasn't technically mikvah, but it did have the concept of the water washing away impurity, washing away dirt and filth, so to speak. And it says all, all in the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were baptized in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. 
people, some people thought maybe he was the Christ. He was the Messiah. Some people thought he was a great prophet. Maybe he was the prophet from Deuteronomy chapter 18. But people went out to hear him preach, to hear him teach, and repented of their sins. And we talked about this well, a few shows ago around Christmas time, <clears throat> because that's when we generally everybody talks about John the Baptist just before that, because of course he was the messenger that was prophesied by Isaiah and also prophesied by Malachi. So he preached repentance because the kingdom was at hand, because a judge was there. And I think we did a couple of shows on that, that Messiah was going to have the winnowing fan in his hand and he was going to separate the wheat and the chaff. And the chaff was going to be burned up and the wheat was going to be used. And also Yeshua himself in Matthew 4, we read about in 17, from that time, Yeshua began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. So a kingdom is at hand. In that um, episode of The Chosen I mentioned with, with Nicodemus, it's interesting that Nicodemus gets kind of overwhelmed with emotion, and he says to him, is the kingdom of God really coming? Is the kingdom of God really coming? We can ask that in today's world. Is the kingdom of God really coming? When we see how the world is today and we see how dark and deep this abyss has gotten, we wonder, is the kingdom of God really coming? And we know as believers that it is. And we know from Psalm 2 that when the world and its leaders plot against the Lord and his anointed one, God laughs because he is on the throne, the world and the demons will try to fight that, but they are not going to prevail. So the kingdom is going to come. So we know about Jonah as a minor prophet. His name means Dove, D-O-V-E. And we know that he's sent to the city of Nineveh. And we're not going to read much of the scripture today, but we're going to read more of it next time. But in Jonah 1, 1, the very beginning of the book, it says, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Nineveh was a very great city in the Tigris-Euphrates area. It was a huge capital. Later on, it's going to tell us that the city was so big that it took three days to walk across it. So a pretty good-sized city. Average person walks at about three miles an hour. So walking eight or so hours a day, quite a few miles across. It was a huge city. And God tells Jonah that the wickedness of that city has come up before him. Now, interestingly, the Hebrew that's used there means the evil has come right up to my face. In other words, I'm face to face with this. This disgusting sin in this place is right in front of me. And you kind of have to wonder if that's our situation today a quarter of the way through the 21st century. And although there's always been evil present in the world, we're living at a an incredibly evil time. But God says this evil in this city of Nineveh has come right up to my face. And he tells Jonah to cry out against it, not to talk about it in secret, not to whisper about it, not to do what we do and whisper about it in prayer groups or home groups because, you know, we don't want to talk about it anywhere in public because we're going to be canceled or we're going to hurt people's feelings or 
We don't want to talk about it in church because we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. But God tells Jonah to cry against it. This reminds me of getting back to John the Baptist just for a second. When it says that John was proclaiming the word in the wilderness, the Greek that's used there means he had a shrill, loud voice. You couldn't help but hear what he was talking about. Interesting, of course, because his father, Zechariah, was mute for nine months and eight days, more or less. But anyway, so the cry's gone up. Jonah has to cry against the sin. And we're going to skip over this because we're going to go into this in the next show. But I guess I should call it a program, not a show. But, you know, Jonah rejects the mission. Just like I said, we don't want to talk against things going on because we're afraid. We don't want to deal with it. We don't want to get upset. We don't want to be hated by people around us. We don't want our coworkers or our friends or our neighbors or people we know to think that we're crazy. So Jonah runs away, just like we run away. So I'm just going to keep to myself. My faith is going to be my personal issue, which of course it should not be. But as you know, Jonah goes and gets on a boat heading toward Tarshish, which is in the opposite direction of Nineveh. And then the storm comes and they realize Jonah's the one who caused the storm. He admits it. They throw him overboard. Um, we're not going to go read all the scripture, but then he gets swallowed up by the great fish who takes him to the coastline near Nineveh, takes him exactly to where he was supposed to go. So then he accepts the mission. God does not chastise him and say, well, you look, look, you know, I, I had high hopes in you that you were going to do this mission. You disobeyed me, so now you're not qualified to do this. So forget it. You can just drown there. Or you can wait for some other ship to come by. Because it was time to get back to the plan. Jonah was not disqualified, even though from a common sense point of view, we would think he was disqualified or should be disqualified at least. But he was not. He picked up the plan, and went on with it. And God gives him the mission that he's to preach. He gives him the message that he is to preach. He doesn't make the message up himself. God doesn't say to him, go and just, you know, go tell them something. I mean, I don't know how to approach these people. You know, whatever you think is best, go and give it a try. Just you know, do the best you can. Use whatever words you think. No, he tells him the mission. 40 days, you have 40 days to repent. And if you don't repent, your city is going to be destroyed. Clear cut, straight to the point. It's not ambiguous in any way. There's no question about it in any way. And there's no doubt about what the outcome is going to be if they don't repent. And this is really the message that goes out, has been going out really since the garden. And it's pretty interesting when you think back to Genesis 3, just before 315, which is kind of the beginning of the plan of salvation. You know, Adam and Eve have fallen. They're hiding. God comes and says, Adam, where are you? In other words, what have you done? Do you realize what's happened now? Where are you? What's your situation now? He didn't ask, where are you? Because he didn't know where Adam was. <clears throat> I know he's around here somewhere. He's probably hiding in some of those bushes over there. He says, where are you? And really, he asks each of us. Where are you? 
if you hear his voice and you don't harden your heart, like they did it, we won't get into all that, NASA and Meribah, you don't harden your heart, you hear his voice and his voice says, where are you? It gives you time to reflect on where you are, what you're doing in your life, what you've done in your life, what your current situation is, what your past situation has been. And maybe it's time for metanoia. Maybe it's time for repentance. But here Jonah gets the clear message to give. In 40 days, you'll be destroyed if you don't repent. Now, you might live on this planet 95 years. You might live 110 years. You might live 15 years. And you might live anywhere in between. But one thing is for sure, if you don't repent, you will be lost. So in other words, in 40, you have a certain amount of time. Nineveh had 40 days. 40 days to repent of their evil. If they did not, then destruction would come. We are each, each have a certain amount of time for that. Varies with each person. Always with good reason why some people get 100 years to repent and some people get 15 years to repent. We don't understand all that and it's not our place to understand all that. But one thing is for sure is after the time is over, if there's been still, if there's been no repentance and there's still evil, then you'll be lost. And so Jonah goes immediately to the city. He doesn't waste any time. He doesn't sit around anymore soul searching about what should he do? I don't know. Where should he start? What should he say? He goes immediately. And there's no question that the message is repentance. Now, the amazing thing about this is that Nineveh is a Gentile city. It's a great city. It's a huge city. It's a Gentile city. It's not a Jewish city. He's not preaching in Jerusalem. He's not preaching anywhere else in Judah. He's not preaching in the Northern Kingdom. He's not preaching in anywhere where Israelites live. He's preaching in a huge Gentile area, a huge Gentile city, a pagan city, a pagan city. And Jonah cries it out. God doesn't change the message to make the Ninevites feel better about their sin. He doesn't say to them, well, you know, maybe you should consider changing some things, but no pressure on you. Because after all, I'm sure you have good reason to think the way you think. No. He says, if you don't repent, you'll be destroyed. He doesn't change the message to make Jonah happy. To have Jonah have what you might say is an easier time. No, he doesn't change the message. The message is not altered at all. The message is the same. The punishment is coming, and there's no question from the message that the punishment is coming from God. Nineveh has a certain amount of time to hear the message, to consider the message, and to either change their situation and have metanoia or ignore the message not take the situation seriously and not repent. So even though in that first couple of verses, it says that the evil literally comes up in God's face. The evil is so intense that it comes up in his face and cries out for judgment. There's a period of time. There's a period of grace, so to speak, where the situation can be rectified. I was talking last night at a home group that I was running and it. We talked about how when COVID began, this was also a time of grace for people. 
who suddenly had everything in their life changed and had a period of time to think about what they were doing with their life, with their work, with their personal life, with their relationships with other people, with family members, with whatever. Maybe they hadn't been praying. Maybe they hadn't been faithful about going to church. Maybe they hadn't been reading scripture, studying. Maybe they hadn't been trying to be a disciple, but now they had a chance because there were very limited things that could be done. And the very... My life was Sabbath. We weren't expecting it. It wasn't the Sabbath on a calendar. It wasn't Friday night sundown. It was a Monday afternoon in March, or I think it was a Monday afternoon. But all of a sudden, everything shut down. It was forced on us, and all our, our activity was curtailed. So if you took advantage of that, it was a period of grace. It was a time of grace. If you didn't take advantage of that, it wasn't. You just went on to, you'll notice the whole world talked about, let's get back to normal. When are we going to get back to normal? And normal is your non-repentant, sinful life for most people. I'm not saying nobody repented, because obviously a lot of people did. But the people in Nineveh believed the message and they repented really quite remarkable. People in the city were fasting, were humbling themselves. Sackcloth, ashes. The king himself heard the message, and he humbled himself. Sackcloth, ashes, repenting. Encouraged the whole population to repent. Even the animals <laughs> put sackcloth and ashes on the animals. There was repentance all the way through the society. The king proclaimed a fast throughout the whole kingdom. We can't even imagine that happening today. So you have this whole kingdom of Assyria, this whole powerful empire, this huge city, fasting, wearing sackcloth and ashes, and repenting, hoping that God will relent. They forgot about their pagan gods. They forgot about their 250, 100, and however many gods they had, and trying to keep them all happy. They wanted to make the true God happy. They believed the message of Jonah. And of course, there's a parallel of that in all of our lives because we're surrounded by idolatry of our own, which can be money, greed, power, lust. There's so many different idols that we have now that, that we can't even number them all. Comfort and... But the question is, are you going to hear the message and turn and realize that those things, although there's nothing wrong with certain of them in certain times, they can't be the idols of your life. You hear the message and turn away. You have metanoia and turn to Messiah. That's how we know that God is going to relent. We don't just hope that he's going to relent. We know that there's a promise of salvation. We know that there's a promise by grace. We know that there's a promise that through faith we can be saved. If we were saved by earning salvation, in other words, if we were saved by meticulously observing every law of Torah, that would be great. But then it wouldn't be a promise. It would be something that we earned. It wouldn't be grace which, as you know, is unmerited favor. You don't deserve it, but you get it. 
So the Assyrians, the Ninevites, hoped that God would relent. We know that he will. The other interesting thing was Jonah did not tell them how to repent. They believed the message and they fasted. And they humbled themselves and they used sackcloth and they used ashes. They didn't do sacrifices. They didn't do, they didn't say, well, what are the rituals in your temple? We'll start doing that. Tell us what we should do. No, they had the idea that uh, David, King David, expresses so powerfully in Psalm 51 about having a humble and contrite heart, having a repentant heart, a humble and contrite heart. And that's what God is looking for. He's not looking for how long are your prayers. He's not looking for how many hours a week do you spend in church. He's not looking for how many hours a week do you spend in the scriptures. He doesn't say how many hours a week do you spend doing meditation or whatever. He says, do you have a humble and contrite heart? And they had that in this great city in much the same way as David talks about in Psalm 51. It's really quite remarkable. And again, these cities, this whole huge city was a Gentile city. They didn't say, get your scrolls and let's look at what David wrote about this. They probably had no idea what David wrote about this. And, you know, it kind of goes back to after the time of Yeshua, when they have the, the evangelists who were the apostles and the other disciples who went through the Mediterranean world, through the Middle East, you know, all through the Greco Roman world, preaching the gospel. You know, it, it's always amazed me that they talked to people who didn't know who Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were, had no idea that the Jews were waiting for a Messiah had no idea what was going on in the temple in Jerusalem, nor did they care. They could have cared less, but they heard a message and came to faith in the Jewish Messiah, came to faith in Yeshua, who was not of their culture, not of their context, not of their background, had nothing to do with the false gods that they followed, the false gods that they were always trying to appease. But they came to him, accepted him, and became believers. And the church age was born. Really quite remarkable. So we see kind of a precursor of this with these Ninevites who probably had no idea, nor did they care about any of this stuff, but they then believed the message that Jonah was giving. They thought they had to change their lives. They thought they had to repent of what they had done. They had to humble themselves, which is a very important part of repentance, as I'm sure you can appreciate. It's a very important part of, of repentance. You know, in the book of Proverbs, it, it tells us that the thing God hates most is a prideful look. I love the old King James description of that as haughty eyes. You know, pride is the basis of most, well, pretty much all sin. And we all have pride. And we don't want to be under anyone. We don't want to anyone to tell us what to do. We want to live our own lives. We want to be independent. So breaking that down is a very important part of repentance because you realize that you've done wrong. You realize where you stand, so to speak. 
So in the case of these Ninevites, we see when God saw this happening, saw their humility, their repentance, the sackcloth, the ashes, and the animals also involved, the king also involved, everybody in the place fasting, he relented of his punishment. So the city would not be destroyed in 40 days because they had turned from their evil ways. And so the punishment was relented. The punishment was suspended. The punishment was not carried out. And of course, the New Testament parallel of that, of course, is that if you humble yourself, if you confess your sins, if you repent of your sins, the punishment against you, because of your repentance and because of putting your faith in what Messiah has done for you, the punishment against you is canceled out, doesn't take place. God relents in the punishment that you deserve. Did the Ninevites deserve grace? No. Did they get grace? Yes. Do we deserve salvation? No. Do we get salvation? Yes. It's unmerited favor. And that's important to repeat because grace isn't really talked about in the right way anymore. But that's a subject for multiple other shows if we talk about hyper grace and um, uh, all these grace movements that are that are going around that are taking people away, in my opinion, from the biblical salvation that that were shown in the scriptures. So it's the same thing with us. It's the same thing that applies in every believer's life. It's the same thing that happened with the Ninevites. We don't have to put on sackcloth and ashes. We don't have to have our animals doing some kind of repentance. But the interesting thing here, as we get to the, to the end of this, and definitely it's going to be another show because we haven't gotten to the good part yet, is along with this being a Gentile city, they responded to one prophet coming. They responded to one man coming with a message, and they repented. The Israelites had many prophets, many prophets over hundreds of years, and they continued in rebellion. When the people are in the wilderness, you know, as I like to say, every time you turn the page, there's another rebellion. And when they got to the land, there were rebellions over and over again. And they had many prophets. Many were sent. Yeshua himself does a beautiful um, a parable of the vineyard where the owner of the vineyard goes away and he sends servants and they abuse him and they kill him. And then he sends his own son. And he says, surely they'll respect my son. Well, they kill him too. And then he asks the question to the people. Yeshua asks the question to the people listening, what's going to become of them? And the people responded, basically, not going to be good. This is not going to end well for these people. So the Israelites had many prophets that abused them, persecuted them, killed most of them. And these were prophets that were their own people, their own people, their own flesh and blood, so to speak, their own brethren from the same roots. The Ninevites had a foreigner come and they repented. The Gentiles of the Greco-Roman world had foreigners come and they repented became believers, <clears throat> and the church was born. Really pretty remarkable. And it's a 
fascinating thing that one prophet who's a stranger led to this massive repentance. And if you've been following the, um, before the time goes up, I say I only have about two minutes left. If you've been following the events at Asbury University in Kentucky, Wilmore is it? I can't remember the name of the town. But there's been a revival going on there for two weeks. In fact, I think it started February 8th. I think it's been just exactly two weeks. And the revival began with a chapel service and a teaching done by a man who was a volunteer assistant soccer coach who had been raised as an ultra-Orthodox Jew, an ultra-Orthodox Jew, came to faith in Yeshua as his Messiah, is involved now at Asbury University, which is a Christian college, as I'm sure you've heard. And he gave a talk, which he didn't think was very interesting. In fact, he texted his wife and said, oh, I did another boring talk. I'll be home in a little while. Struck out again. In fact, the term he used was I whiffed again. And as the talk ended, a student came forward and said he had sinned, that he wanted to confess and repent. And then some others came. And over a period of a couple of hours time, this chapel service, which was supposed to be over quite a while, quite a while before this, kept going on as people came forward and repented and confessed. And again, as we said at the beginning, repentance is the way into the kingdom. And we're seeing in that, you know, whatever you think of this revival, and it, it may be too early to tell, but many people, including Dr. Michael Brown, and that's good enough for me, think that this is a real revival. This is really a move of the spirit. And it began with repentance. Whew. Well, that's a little bit about Jonah and Nineveh. Um, next time, we're going to connect this to some very powerful messianic ideas. So I hope you'll join us. Mm -hmm.